Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're kicking off a new lore series on the channel titled The Nanman Expedition. But before we can jump into this story here, there is a lot of background information that we need to get out of the way. So that is why we have this episode 0 here, or the prologue. Now, the Nanman Expedition is the backdrop of the next confirmed DLC for Total War Three Kingdoms, and it takes place from March 225 to December of the same year. And it highlights the conflict between the Shu Han forces led by Zhuge Liang and the Nanman forces led by Meng Huo. Now, I understand that this time frame is quite far removed from the last two DLC that took place in 182 and 194 respectively. So in this episode, I'll provide a quick recap of all the events that's happening for all the three kingdoms right before this event so that we know what kind of the backdrop of the conditions are during the three kingdoms period when this took place. But first we have a more pressing question, who or what are the Naman? So Naman is a term that can be literally translated character by character with nan meaning south and man meaning barbarians. So this term has its origins from the pre-Tin dynasty era when China was really just the Huaxia region in the central plains as you can see in the map. And within the central plain or Huaxia region, you kind of had the two river system of the Yellow River and the Yangtze River and this is kind of the birthplace of the Chinese civilization, the Han ethnic civilization. And everyone around them was deemed to be barbarians. And a term for each of these regions were invented during that time. So in the north, you had Bei Di, Bei meaning north, Di also meaning barbarians, but for the northern barbarians. And then you have Si Rong, Si meaning west, and Rong meaning barbarians once again, but only for the western barbarians. Same thing for Dong Yi, which is covered the east, and finally for Nan Man, covering the south. So that's why you have this term that's kind of collectively grouping all of the southern different minority tribes and ethnic groups into this very generalized term. So Nanman here covers a lot of different tribes, although in this case, it refers to a very specific one that existed during the Three Kingdoms period. So with this fact in mind, let's start looking at what's going on with the Three Kingdoms period about five years before this event. So here we have a map of the Three Kingdom period in the year 219. And I picked this year because this was kind of the peak of Liu Bei's power. And we can see Liu Bei's faction covered in yellow here to the west. And you have Cao Cao's forces in the salmon to the north and Sun Quan's forces in the southeast in the green. So what's going on in 219 is in the early month of this year, Liu Bei, launched a northern expedition to attack Hanzhong. Now Hanzhong is this choke point in the mountain valleys to the north of the Shu region. And it was always under the control of Cao Cao, under the command of his most trusted general, Xia Hou Yuan, who is a relative of Cao Cao. And Liu Bei desperately wanted this land because it was the gateway to enter the central plains from the Shu region, which is rather mountainous. So Huang Zhong and Liu Bei launched their attack against this area, and through this campaign, they were able to not only take Han Zhong, they were also able to slay Xia Hou Yuan during this campaign. So Cao Cao not only lost a key stronghold out here in the west, he also lost a key general. And this kind of played into the plan that Zhuge Liang had laid out to Liu Bei when he had first joined Liu Bei. And that plan involved Liu Bei building his strong base in the Shu region, similar to the founding Liu clan member of the Han Dynasty and Liu Bang, who spent a long time in Hanzhong and in Shu, building up his forces before coming out of the Central Plains and defeating the Chu forces in the Chu Han contention. So Liu Bei is kind of following that footstep, and a key part of this plan is a pincer attack against Cao Cao, and the northern part of this pincer is through Hanzhong into Chang'an and attacking into Luoyang and Xuchang, which is the current capital of Cao Cao's forces. And the southern prong of this pincer is launched from Jinzhou, which Liu Bei has quote unquote borrowed from Sun Quan following their united win at Chibi. 
and currently being held by Guan Yu. So following their success in the northern campaign in the early part of the year, in July, Guan Yu launched his southern offense against Cao Cao's forces, and he had great success early on, as very soon Guan Yu was able to attack Fan Cheng and defeat Pang De and slay him in this battle, and also capture another very trusted officer of Cao Cao in Yu Jin. So with this win, Guan Yu started to split his force and pull out of Jinzhou to attack Xiangyang and surround the last stronghold in Fan Cheng, which Cao Ren still held. And Guan Yu's sudden success here really put the fear in Cao Cao's faction. Because if Guan Yu can take Fan Cheng and defeat Cao Ren, there will be no more resistance between where Guan Yu is and the capital of Xuchang. And Cao Cao even had a big internal debate with his court to move the capital to Ye, north of the Yellow River, to try to respond to Guan Yu's offenses. That's how threatening this was with this move and the earlier wins during the year at Hanzhong. But instead of retreating, Cao Cao came up with a plan to convince Sun Quan to use this opportunity as Guan Yu has emptied out the defenses of Jinzhou to put himself into this offensive position to help Sun Quan reclaim this borrowed land of the Jin province, which Liu Bei had promised to return after entering into the Shu region. But clearly, after Liu Bei has taken over the Shu region, Liu Bei refused to return this land to Sun Quan, and this quote-unquote alliance between Sun Quan and Liu Bei sort of fractured over this fact. It was just kind of a cold war between the factions, where they pretend to be friends, but deep down inside, the conflict over this province is brooding on both sides. So Sun Quan commands his advisor and Da Dudu at the time in Lu Xun, who is a relatively young general, to launch a plan to retake Jinzhou. So they snuck up behind Guan Yu's lines, where Guan Yu really didn't leave any men to defend Jinzhou, thinking that Sun Quan would be their ally and not backstab them at this critical moment against Cao Cao. And Lu Xun was able to command Lu Meng to disguise their army as trade merchants on the Yangtze River, to sneak into the various commanderies of Jinzhou with very few defense and convince them to surrender. So all of a sudden, as Guan Yu is in a siege near Fan Cheng and Xiangyang, Jinzhou pretty much all surrendered to Wu as there were very few defensive forces behind. And Guan Yu was kind of trapped with Cao Cao's forces in front of him and Sun Quan's forces to the south. And at this moment, all Guan Yu could really do is pull out his siege and retreat south to Mai Cheng before trying to make a break for it to the west. But unfortunately, many of his men were already very low morale, hearing that most of the commandery that they had control over had surrendered, and many of the local forces nearby refused to send help, and Guan Yu was basically trapped in this city. And when the situation finally got dire at the end of the year, Guan Yu decided to make a break for it himself with some of the men in the dead of winter. But unfortunately, he was captured alive by Sun Quan's forces, and on Sun Quan's command, Guan Yu was executed. And Guan Yu's head was sent to Xu Chang as a prize to Cao Cao. And this was kind of a move that Sun Quan did to kind of frame this betrayal on Cao Cao saying that it was Cao Cao who wanted Guan Yu dead to kind of push away any responsibilities or wrath that Liu Bei might throw on him. But Cao Cao didn't fall for this. Cao Cao treated Guan Yu's head with respect, carved his body out of wood, placed his head together, and gave him a state funeral, and sent his grievances to Liu Bei. But fate would also have it that in the very next month, in January of 220, Cao Cao dies of natural causes at the age of 66. And right away, Cao Pi takes over. And immediately, Cao Pi makes a move that his father dared not to do by forcing the emperor to abdicate and ending the Han dynasty and heralding the Wei dynasty. And not only did this happen, Liu Bei lost Jinzhou to Sun Quan. And the frontier part of the northern territory that Liu Bei had captured, the general he left behind, seeing that Liu Bei's forces had lost Jinzhou, decided that it was better to surrender to Wei at this time as Cao Pi has abolished the Han. So in the end, Liu Bei lost Jinzhou and also a northern part of Hanzhong. And in the following year, in 221, Liu Bei 
knowing that the Han Dynasty has been ended by Cao Pi, crowns himself emperor as well, with the name of Han as a mean to continue the Han Dynasty. So they definitely didn't call themselves Shu, right? Shu Han is a term that later historians used to label this period as they were the continuation of the Han Dynasty in the Shu region. But this fact has been misconstrued in many later generations where we now like to call them Shu, which is definitely not the term they would like to use because they wanted to be known as Han. They were the continuation of the official government with the Liu clan as Cao Pi has taken the step to usurp the original Han dynasty. But sadly for the new emperor Liu Bei, good news didn't last long as in June, when Zhang Fei was making preparations for revenge for Guan Yu, his subordinates assassinated him and fled to Wu to join Sun Quan. So Liu Bei very quickly lost a lot of land, lost his sworn brother Guan Yu, and lost his sworn brother Zhang Fei. So in July, seeing all these events correlate to Sun Quan's betrayal, Liu Bei, against the advice of many of his advisors, decides to launch an attack against Sun Quan. Now Liu Bei attacking Sun Quan is very different from Cao Cao attacking Sun Quan. As you can see, the mighty Yangtze River splits the Shu region in half. So Liu Bei actually doesn't have to invade Sun Quan through the Yangtze River, which renders Sun Quan's strongest strength the navy completely useless. So Sun Quan is quite afraid, and he releases Yu Jin, who he had taken prisoner after killing Guan Yu, to Cao Pi, and bends the knee to Cao Pi, acknowledging the dynasty of Wei. And Cao Pi gives him the title of Prince of Wu. So note here, Sun Quan is not one of the three kingdoms yet. There is the Wei dynasty to the north, the continuation of the Han dynasty in the Shu region, and Sun Quan at this moment when Liu Bei attacked him, decided to bend the knee to Cao Pi to receive some help because he's worried he can't beat Liu Bei's forces. But fortunately for him, Lu Xun was a very capable strategist and Liu Bei made a very poor mistake in how he set up his encampments, and Lu Xun was able to launch a fire attack that completely wiped out the Shu forces, forcing them to retreat. But here is where the story gets interesting, because Cao Pi saw this as an opportunity where Liu Bei and Sun Quan are fighting it out, and he can send the might of the Wei, which is the strongest of the Three Kingdoms at this time, to wipe both of them out and end the Three Kingdoms period. So he knew deep down Sun Quan wasn't really bending the knee to him. So as Lu Xun won this fight, Zhang Liao, Zhang He, Xu Huang, Cao Ren launched a coordinated attack on the northern banks of the Yangtze River. So Sun Quan, forced to defend his territories from Cao Pi's attacks, made a temporary peace deal with Liu Bei at the end of 222. And Liu Bei, fresh off his defeat and pretty much at the low point of the Shu kingdom, accept this uneasy peace. And we have to note, this is just a peace deal. It's not a renewed alliance. The relationship is still pretty bad because as you can imagine, Liu Bei is going to have a hard time trusting Sun Quan ever again. But Sun Quan also had a lot of struggle during this time too, as Cao Zhen was able to take Jiangxia, which is a very key point on the north bank of the Yangtze River. But fortunately for him, he was able to beat back Cao Ren in Nanjun or else they would have had another Tribi situation on their hand. And following this battle, which took place in March of 223, the Three Kingdoms period kind of entered an uneasy peace after a series of fightings in the previous two years. But the news for Liu Bei is just about to get worse, as Liu Bei will pass away in April, mainly due to a series of depression and emotional drain in the past few years, given the losses that he suffered. And on his deathbed, he passes his throne to his son Liu Chan and asks Zhuge Liang to become the regent to guide his son to restore the Han dynasty. But it's going to get a lot worse. As in June, the southern tribe led by Meng Huo and three of the southern commandery administrators decide that Shu Han is getting very weak and now is the time to rebel. And they launch this rebellion that kind of took control of most of the Shu region south of the Yangtze River. And at the time, Zhuge Liang had really no response 
because the Shuhan army was still recuperating from the losses at Lianying the year before, and Liu Bei had just died, so a lot of the internal court needed to be consolidated to make sure there's not any more fracturing. So the first thing Zhuge Liang did at the end of this year was to reforge the alliance with Sun Quan, and that kind of cleared his way to recover in the year 224, where Shu spent a whole year consolidating and revitalizing their military so they could launch their southern expansion into the Nanman territories to reclaim this lost land that was lost in this rebellion. So that's kind of the backdrop of the story and where we will start in our first episode. But before we end this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about this region here where the rebellion will take place and where this Nanman campaign will take place and kind of correlate to where it is in game and how it will appear in the next DLC. Now the DLC components mainly speculations for me. Uh, my information comes from the AMA or Ask Me Anything thread that CA did on the forum and on Reddit. So here we have the game map. Zoom in to the southwest portion of China. And if we use the capital city of Chengdu as kind of our reference point, what we see here is that the region where this rebellion takes place covers the commanderies of Yunnan, Yizhou, and Zhangke, and parts of the area that's not in the game map. And from what the developers have said in the AMA, this DLC will not be a chapter pack, and it will not be a culture pack. So chapter packs are the DLCs we've been getting, where you have a different start date, and you jump in and you enjoy the Three Kingdom story in a sandbox mode from that start date on. Cultural packs are kind of like content or asset added into the game. So I envision this DLC to be kind of a miniature campaign set on a new map that kind of extends exclusively into this region because there's really only two factions you really need to play for this part of the story because this is exclusively a story that covers the conflict between the Shu Han forces led by Zhuge Liang and the Nan Man forces led by Meng Huo. So it kind of makes sense for this to take place in a slightly miniature campaign. And in terms of how I'm going to be presenting this lore series, we're first going to do this similar to our Chibi lore series on the channel, where I will cover the romance of the Three Kingdom novel version of the story. And that version, of course, is not entirely historical, but it's super exciting. It's something that made me fall in love with the character Zhuge Liang when I was growing up and reading the Romance of the Three Kingdom. And I really want to share it with you guys. And that's probably going to be the primary source of how the developer would design this DLC and let us enjoy the game in this kind of epic tale where Zhuge Liang not only conquers Meng Huo in a military struggle, but also mentally force him to capitulate and become you know, this vassal that will not rebel ever again. So we're going to kind of see that in our story by covering all the Romance of the Three Kingdoms story. Then after we cover the Romance of the Three Kingdoms story in its entirety, what I will do is I will supplement a few episodes where we will talk about the historical records of this expedition. And to be fair, the historical records are very scant because San Guozhi, the official records of Three Kingdom didn't actually record this event because it was exclusively to Chu Han. And it was so far in the south, many of those in the Wei region and in the Wu region had no idea this was even going on. So it wasn't like a coordinated thing happening. Zhuge Liang was taking a gamble, thinking that Cao Pi has exhausted himself and Sun Quan exhausted himself in their battles the year before. So he had this break where he could go down south, take care of this problem, and secure the base for Shu before focusing his attention on a series of northern expeditions to try to restore the Han. So that's kind of where we're going to go with this, and I hope you guys are excited for it as I am. So we're going to be kicking off this lore series. It will be on every Monday and Wednesday at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So hope you guys come back Wednesday for episode one. See you guys then. Bye!